Good morning, students. Today is Friday, 26 March, 2021. <clears throat> this will be our second lecture of the week and also the second of three days on the essay by John Hardwig entitled, Is There a Duty to Die? Now, next week is a big week. We're not only going to finish Hardwig uh, early in the week, probably on Tuesday, but we're also going to pause and take our second exam next week. It'll be on the 1st of April, which is Thursday. <clears throat> the exam will be available for you from 8 in the morning until 8 in the evening. The exam itself is 75 minutes in length, so when you get started, make sure you're ready to complete it. You'll have 75 minutes to do so. So let's get started. Let's get back to Hardwig. Notice that he divides his essay up into several sections. We covered a few of the sections in our first lecture. Today I want to begin with the section entitled The Individualistic Fantasy. It's quite short. In fact, it consists of five paragraphs. And because in, in some ways it's the most important section of the, of the essay, I'm going to read the five paragraphs with you pausing after each paragraph to give a brief discussion of it. If, if this were a classroom situation, then of course you could raise your hand and ask questions, but you know, try to anticipate some of your concerns and reply to them uh, after I read the appropriate paragraph. So I have my copy of the essay here, and it's on page 35, so you can follow along if you would like. The section entitled The Individualistic Fantasy goes like this. Because a duty to die seems such a real possibility to me, I wonder why contemporary bioethics has dismissed it without serious consideration. I believe that most bioethics still shares in one of our deeply embedded American dreams, colon, the individualistic fantasy. This fantasy leads us to imagine that lives are separate and unconnected, or that, there could, that they could be so if we chose. If lives were unconnected, things that happened in my life would not or need not affect others, would not or need not affect others. And if others were not much affected by my life, I would have no duty to consider the impact of my decisions on others. I would then be free morally to live my life however I please, choosing whatever life and death I prefer for myself. The way I live would be nobody's business but my own. I certainly would have no duty to die if I preferred to live. Okay, that's paragraph one of five. Let's say a few words about it. Notice the uh, he points out something that seemed true to him in 1997. He said contemporary bioethics has not has dismissed without serious consideration this question of whether there is a moral duty to die. Now things have changed somewhat in the past couple of decades. More and more philosophers are now discussing the topic and taking positions on it largely because of this essay by Hardwig. He raised the issue. Uh, he complained that the issue had not been much discussed, and now bioethicists have taken his lead and begun to discuss it. There's no consensus on the answer in the sense that everyone agrees. Some people believe with Hardwig that there is a duty to die. Other people disagree and claim that there is no such duty. Notice that he gives this, uh, he, he describes a particular fantasy, which he calls the individualistic fantasy, and he thinks that that fantasy, which is shared by many bioethicists, is part of the explanation, maybe a large part of the explanation, for why bioethics hasn't taken this issue seriously up until the writing of this essay. So what is this so-called individualistic fantasy? It's the idea that individuals are disconnected or unconnected with others. Uh, so the image is of separate, um, isolated individuals, each living their own life with few or no connections to others. Now, 
Hardwick points out forthrightly that if this were an accurate picture of our lives, if we really did live in this unconnected way, then what we do with our lives and how we die would be up to us. And he, he says he would have no problem with people living as long as they please. The problem comes in when we realize that we're not unconnected to others. We are connected to them. We're not separate, we're connected. And because we're connected to other people, we have duties to them. And if we become a burden to them, uh, then perhaps we have a duty to unburden them. And that may require that we allow ourselves to die or even take steps to bring about our own death. So Hardwig is suggesting that the problem with the, uh, the reason why bioethics hasn't taken this issue seriously is because there's a kind of fantasy that's interwoven in people's thinking, this individualistic fantasy. Notice when he calls it a fantasy, that implies that it's not the reality, right? We have, we make a distinction between reality and fantasy or fantasy land. So <clears throat> Jurassic Park, the movie, uh, the series of movies, Jurassic Park is fantasy, right? It's about reviving dinosaurs uh, in our world. Okay? That's not reality, that's fantasy. So Hardwig is suggesting that there's a certain fantasy or false picture that underlies uh, bioethicist um, resistance to taking this issue seriously. Okay, second paragraph, page 35. Within a healthcare context, the individualistic fantasy leads us to assume that the patient is the only one affected by decisions about her medical treatment. If, notice, if only the patient were affected, the relevant questions when making decision, treatment decisions would be precisely those we ask. What will benefit the patient? Who can best decide that? The pivotal issue would always be simply whether the patient wants to live like this and whether she would consider herself better off dead. Whose life is it anyway, we ask rhetorically. So in this paragraph, Hardwig is going to start applying the individualistic fantasy to the healthcare context. And he's he says that if we really were isolated and unconnected to others, then when people get sick or old, the decision about what to do uh, is up to them. And if they decide they want to continue living, so be it. Whose life is it anyway but the person affected? Okay, now in paragraph three, he proceeds to say why this is problematic. He says, but this is morally obtuse. Now, the word obtuse, if you looked it up in the dictionary, means, where do I have it here? Insensitive or stupid. So an obtuse person is someone who's insensitive or perhaps even stupid, someone who's not attuned to the details of the situation, right? So this is morally stupid, he is saying, or insensitive. We're not a race of hermits. Illness and death do not come only to those who are all alone. Nor is it much better to think in terms of the bald dichotomy between, quote, the interests of the patient, unquote, and, quote, the interests of society, or a third-party payer, as if we were isolated individuals connected only to society in the abstract or to the other faceless members of our health maintenance organization. So in this paragraph, he is saying that the fantasy is just that, a fantasy. It's not reality. This is not our world. We are connected to other people, sometimes many other people. And how we behave has effects on them, right? Things we do affect others either beneficially or detrimentally. We can, we can have adverse effects on other people through our actions or inactions, our failure to act. Okay, so now he's, he's pointing out that 
uh, the facts of the situation, right? The reality contrasts with the fantasy picture that many people have. Fourth paragraph on the top of page 36. He says, most of us are affiliated with particular others and most deeply with family and loved ones. Families and loved ones are bound together by ties of care and affection, by legal relations and obligations, by inhabiting shared spaces and living units, by interlocking finances and economic prospects, by common projects and also commitments to support the different life projects of other family members. He says, um, by shared histories, by ties of loyalty. Sorry, I thought I had the end of the sentence. The sentence was still going. This life together of family and loved ones is what defines and sustains us. It is what gives meaning to most of our lives. We would not have it any other way. We would not want to be all alone, especially when we're seriously ill, as we age, and when we are dying. So now in this fourth paragraph, he starts to flesh out the reality for most of us, almost all of us, maybe not literally all of us, because there may truly be some hermits out there who have no family or friends. But for almost everyone else, you and me, for example, we do have family, we have loved ones, and we're connected with them in innumerable ways through love and affection. Our finances are intermingled. Um, we're, we have emotional bonds and connections, and those bonds and connections create duties or obligations to one another. And we, he points out we would have it no other way. These interconnections we have with our loved ones are what give our lives meaning. How many times have you heard someone say in old age that really looking back on my life, what was most important was not my career or my accomplishments or how much money I earned, but, but the relations I had with my family, my loved ones. And Hardwick is simply pointing out that that is the case for most of us. This is what gives our lives meaning and makes, it, makes our lives worthwhile and worth living. And he points out that this is all the more so when we're sick or injured or dying. And that's when our connections to others become most important. And finally, the fifth of five paragraphs, Hardwig says, but the fact of deeply inter interwoven lives debars us or prevents us from making exclusively self-regarding decisions as the decisions of one member of a family may dramatically affect the lives of all the rest. The impact of my decisions, the agent's decisions, upon my family and loved ones is the source of many of my strongest obligations and also the most plausible and likeliest basis of a duty to die. Society, notice he put that word in quotation marks, He's treating society as an abstraction, which of course it is. Society, after all, is only very marginally affected by how I live or by whether I live or die. So that completes the section entitled The Individualistic Fantasy. In that fifth paragraph of that section, Hard Hardwig is pointing out that these interwoven lives that we have are the basis of a duty or obligation to them, to, the, to those others. And if we owe a duty to other people, especially a duty to die, it's because of the burdens that our continued living imposes on them. Now, there may be some small or minor effects on society at large, this abstraction, society. And that's because if I continue living uh, when I'm become, I've become very costly, not just to my family members, but to society, you could say that society now has a claim on me. I have a duty not to inflict harm on society, which consists of lots of other individuals who need resources just as I do. So Hardwig de-emphasizes the effect of our actions on society, and he puts the greatest emphasis on the effects of our actions on 
our family members or loved ones. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, he doesn't rule out society altogether. What he's saying is that the effect of my actions on society is attenuated or trivial, minor, compared to how my actions affect those who are near and dear to me, my family members, my loved ones. Okay, now Hardwig, uh, as you know, criticizes this individualistic fantasy. He calls it obtuse, which means insensitive or even stupid. And he points out that it's a fantasy. It, it's not at all the reality for most people. We simply don't live like hermits, uh, where our actions have no effects on other people. So let's move on to the next section. Um, Hardwig has a section entitled, A Burden to My Loved Ones. In this section, he lays out in more specificity the actual burdens that our actions impose on other people. He says on page 36, the burdens of providing care or even just supervision 24 hours a day, seven days a week are often overwhelming. So he must be imagining a situation like this. He's imagining a, a case where someone who is very sick, maybe old and frail, needs constant supervision. Someone must be there at all times to see that the person uh, has adequate nutrition and hydration, to see that the person um, it doesn't fall out of the bed, that could be a, a problem, to see that the person has uh, his or her bodily needs provided for, defecation, urination, and so on. Um, if the person is in pain, someone must be there to monitor the pain and to take steps to alleviate the pain by providing medicine. And that would be another component of this. As you know, people who are on medication have to have it at a certain time and in a certain way throughout the day. And that requires supervision. Someone must be there to see that you get your medicine on time and in the proper dosages. Now, you may think here of child rearing. Uh, being a parent of especially a young child requires constant supervision and attention. Well, the same would be true for someone who's old and frail and sick. Right? It would be like having a newborn in the household. And this can be overwhelming. Uh, it can cause emotional devastation. Those are his words. He says it can be emotionally devastating. And keep in mind that there are financial costs as well as emotional costs involved in caretaking for a family member. He points out that some in some cases, because the financial costs are so great, a family can't afford to hire an outside caregiver, someone to come into the household and provide care for the person in question. So some family member may have to do so. And that sometimes requires that people uh, quit their jobs. Uh, and when you quit your job, that means a source of income has gone away. So if family members have to quit work to provide care, that can provide a, a great burden on the family, the whole family. Things that they otherwise would have are no longer available to them because they've had to cut back or cut corners. There, some, in some cases, savings have to be expended. People save money for the future for various reasons. Sometimes it's a rainy day fund, right? You don't know what it's going to be for, but you want a certain amount of money set aside for things that come up along the way. Well, maybe because of the loved one's injury or sickness, you have to tap into that rainy day fund and spend the money. That You may say, well, that's what it's for. but And that may be true. But when you use it for caretaking for your loved one, that means it's not available for other things. And therefore, you may become more, you may be put in a more precarious financial position because your savings have become depleted or precariously low. Okay, and that, that's a common uh, effect of caretaking. Another example Hardwood gives is uh, children having to forego college. Imagine children in high school getting ready for college. Money, money has been set aside for them to provide for their tuition. 
and room and board and books and fees? What if the money has now been used for caretaking for the loved one? That child may not be able to go to college now as a result of that. And that's a, excuse me, that's a serious cost of this sickness. Now, Hardwig doesn't give just one side of the picture. He admits, and this is to his credit, he admits that there can be benefits as well as costs to caretaking, to providing care for one's sick family member. Uh, for example, it can foster growth. Right? The, the act or practice of caring for others is a way of fostering growth, personal growth. Right? You, you learn to be less focused on yourself and more focused on others. Uh, that's, that's an essential part of, of um, personal growth and maturity. He says on page 36, if my loved ones are truly benefiting from coping with my illness or debility, I have no duty to die based on burdens to them, unquote. Now that's a very interesting sentence because Hardwig, Hardwig is suggesting that whether you have a duty to, to die depends solely on whether you're a burden and if so, how much of a burden you are. And if the family members who are caring for you truly and sincerely do not mind doing so and do not experience it as a burden, then you are not imposing a cost on them. Right? They are not burdened. They're, they're performing the care, but they may not experience it as a burden. And therefore, you do not, at least at that time, have a duty to die. Your duty to die depends solely on whether you've become a burden, and if so, how much. He says responsibility is a two-way street. You not only have a responsibility to your loved ones, not to burden them excessively, but they have a responsibility to you to care for you, to provide for you. They presumably won't just cast you out at the first sign of sickness and tell you you must allow yourself to die by foregoing necessary medical treatment or even uh, worse, to bring about your death. So the point is, there has to be a relation of mutual respect between the family members. Neither side may reduce the other to a mere means. So don't use your family members if you're sick and frail. Uh, don't use your family members as a mere means to your own ends. Right? That's disrespectful to them. And by the same token, they shouldn't use you as a mere means to their ends. Right? They shouldn't as soon as you become the slightest burden, uh, inform you that your duty to die has kicked in and it's time to go, grandpa or grandma. Right? That would not be respectful of them. Now, I think in this pair, I'm sorry, in this section of the article, there is the argument. The, the argument is embedded in here. Now, Hardwig, though he is a philosopher, does not lay out the argument step by step. So I'm going to reconstruct his argument based upon what he says in this section of the article. So here's my reconstruction. Write it down carefully because there will certainly be a question or two or three about this argument. And I want to make sure you understand it. So I'm going to explain it very carefully to you. The argument has two premises followed by a conclusion. The first premise is what's called the major premise because it sets forth a, a general principle. The second premise is called the minor premise because it states the particular facts of the case. When you apply the major premise to the minor premise, you get a conclusion. The conclusion is said to follow from the two premises. So once the argument is laid out, we can then evaluate it. We can ask several questions about it. We can ask, whether the first premise is true. Is the major premise actually true? Maybe it's not, right? Maybe it needs to be supported and maybe Hardwig hasn't done enough to support it. So we wouldn't want to say it's false, but it hasn't been shown to be true. We can also ask about the second premise. Is the second premise true? 
right? And if not, what can be said to show that it's true? And finally, once we examine the two premises, we can ask whether even if the premises are assumed to be true, does the conclusion follow from them? Does it follow logically from them? In other words, is this a valid argument? Okay. Validity has to do with the structure of the argument. Specifically, it has to do with the relation between the premises of the argument and the conclusion. Some arguments are invalid. That means that even if their premises were true, the conclusion would not follow from them. Let me give you a quick example. It may strike you as silly, but it makes the point. Suppose I said Austin is the capital of Texas. Today is Friday. Therefore, Joe Biden is president. Now, the premises of that argument are true. Austin is, in fact, the capital of Texas, and today is, in fact, Friday. <clears throat> the conclusion is even true. Joe Biden is president. But the conclusion doesn't follow logically from those premises. I hope you can see that. And the reason you can see that so clearly is because the premises have nothing to do with the conclusion. There's no connection between what the capital of Texas is and what day it is and the conclusion about who the president is. So people sometimes make invalid arguments. They sometimes state premises and then claim that some conclusion follows from those premises when in fact it doesn't. Right? People make mistakes when they're arguing or reasoning. They, they state an argument and think that it's valid when in fact it's not. Okay, so here's the argument with all that is the buildup. Here is the major premise or what I take to be the major premise of Hardwig's argument. Now, first I'm going to state it and then I'll talk about it. It goes like this. There is a prima facie duty not to harm others. Period. There's a prima facie duty not to harm others. Now you should recognize that as one of the four principles of medical ethics that was described by Ra'anan Gillen just recently in this course. R remember the four principles? The principle of respect for autonomy, the principle of beneficence, the principle of non-maleficence, and the principle of justice. Okay, which of those four principles does this one sound like? I'm going to repeat it. There is a prima facie duty not to harm others. Well, obviously, that's the principle of non-maleficence. Okay, so the major premise of Hardwig's argument is simply a statement of a principle that is widely accepted. I don't know of anybody offhand who would disagree with this premise mainly because it has the words prima facie in it. When you say that there's a prima facie duty, that means that there's a duty that remains a duty unless some more powerful duty overwhelms it or overrides it. Now, if I said there's an absolute duty not to harm others, lots of people would deny that. Lots of people would claim that's false, right? Because while there may be a duty to harm others, it can't be absolute. That would mean that it always prevails in every situation, no matter what else is at stake, no matter, no matter what other duties there may be in that situation. So I, I formulated this principle in the most plausible way. I said, there is a prima facie duty not to harm others. Okay, so... The way it's formulated is in a way that almost everyone, if not literally everyone, would accept. Second premise. This is now the minor premise of Hardwig's argument. Listen carefully. I'm going to read it and then discuss it with you. There are situations in which continuing to live harms others. Period. There are situations. Now, it doesn't matter how many. There's at least one situation, maybe many, in which the mere fact that you are continuing to live harms others. And you can see why that is or why that might be true. 
Uh, imagine someone who's very old and very frail, who needs constant supervision of the sort we described earlier today. Uh, that constant supervision has caused a great deal of harm to the family. Financial harm, maybe the children, some of the children have been unable to go off to college because that would, the money that would be used for that is being used for um, caretaking. Um, it may be imposing a great emotional um, harm on the family members. It could be emotionally devastating. Uh, maybe one or more family members has had to quit work to provide care. Maybe the savings of the family are being depleted or have been depleted and so on. All the things Hardwig mentioned earlier come into play here. Once again, there are situations in which continuing to live harms others. Why? Because it imposes significant burdens on those others. Now, what do you get when you put those two premises together? The first premise is a general principle, non-maleficence. It says there's a prima facie duty not to harm others. The second premise says there are situations in which merely continuing to live harms others. The conclusion is, the conclusion that follows from those premises is, there are situations in which one has a prima facie duty not to continue to live. There are situations in which one has a prima facie duty not to continue to live. If we want, we can call that a prima facie duty to die. So the title of this essay is, Is There a Duty to Die? This argument provides Hardwig's answer. Yes, there is a duty to die. It's prima facie. It's not an absolute duty, but it is a prima facie duty. And it's a duty either to uh, allow yourself to die or to bring about your death, to kill yourself. Now, Hardwick doesn't go into details about um, how this death is brought about. So I took it upon myself to canvas the various ways. If you're following along in my notes, you'll see I'm at the bottom of page five of my notes and I wrote ways to die. And I know it's a, it's a, an uncomfortable subject, but I'm trying to be a good philosopher. I'm trying to lay out all of the logical possibilities, ways to end up dead or ways you can go from life to death. Okay. Number one, the death could be by suicide. Suicide means killing of oneself. S-U-I means self, and C-I-D-E means killing of. So suicide literally means killing oneself. And you can see that there are two basic types of suicide, assisted and unassisted. Some people kill themselves without any assistance. Some people own guns, and they may use their gun to end their lives with no assistance from anyone else. They didn't need to borrow a gun. They didn't need to have someone hold it for them or, or anything like that, or load it. They just got the gun and ended their lives. That's suicide. Assisted suicide is where, for one reason or another, either because you're unable to kill yourself or because you can't bring yourself to kill yourself, you ask for someone's assistance. Do you remember a doctor named Jack Kevorkian? If not, look him up, read his Wikipedia page. I'm sure it's quite long. Um, but many years ago, a couple of decades ago, I think, Dr. Kevorkian, I, and I think he was from my home state of Michigan, Dr. Kevorkian, as an old man, a retired doctor, offered his services in helping people end their lives. He became known as Dr. Death. What he did is he rigged up a van with a device uh, which you can find pictures of it in on Google image search, I'm sure. He rigged up a device whereby um, if someone pushed a certain, after a needle was put into your body, you could push a button if you so chose, and that would cause leth a lethal dose of chemicals to go into your body and bring about your death. Now, it was more complicated than that. I think it first had a sedative, so you could sedate yourself, and then you could push that last button, and it would 
end up causing your death. And what Dr. Kevorkian do was, did was he made that device available to people. And people came from all over the country, uh, people who were terminally ill and in pain and couldn't get anyone to help them die. They went to Dr. Kevorkian. He questioned them to make sure they were competent. He then um, a lot explained the apparatus to them. And he um, put the needle in and he said, here's what you do. If you want to kill yourself, here's what you do. And some of them did it and died. He then called the coroner. Uh, the body was picked up and so on. Now, Dr. Kevorkian got into trouble with the law many times. He served time in prison. He, he claimed all along that he never killed anybody. He said, I never committed homicide. What I did was I helped people commit suicide. These were people who were, in many cases, uh, ter terminally ill. They were going to die soon anyway. They were racked with pain, and they had made their peace with their family members and friends, and they were ready to go. And Dr. Kevorkian said, I was an angel of mercy. I simply helped them kill themselves. So that's what I have under assisted suicide. The person who ends up dead is saying, in effect, help me kill myself, please. I, I, I can't do it myself, or I'm unwilling and unable uh, psychologically, physically to do it. Please help me. Please help me end my life. Okay, so Dr. Kevorkian would be an example of assisted suicide. Also, remember the Morris versus Brandenburg case we recently discussed? What the plaintiffs were, Asia Riggs and her, her doctors were asking for, was the right to end their lives uh, and not be prosecuted for it under New Mexico law. Uh, the state of Oregon has a law on the books, passed by the legislature, signed by the governor, that specifies a procedure by which people who are terminally ill and in pain can get a lethal dose of a medicine, of a drug prescribed by their doctor, and they can take it home and use it to end their lives if they so choose. So what we're calling physician-assisted suicide would be a special case of this. You see where it says assisted suicide? Physician-assisted suicide would be in that category. But of course, you can get assistance in killing yourself without the assistance coming from a doctor. You could have a relative, a friend, uh, a sibling, for example, uh, help you end your life. Okay, the next category is what I call active euthanasia. Now, euthanasia is sometimes called mercy killing. It means literally a good or happy death. And it's, a, it's the kind of thing you see in some of those Western movies where a horse has broken a leg and can no longer be ridden, uh, the, the cowboy, I'll say, uh, rather than leave the horse there on the prairie to die a lingering and painful death, will end the life of the horse by killing it, by shooting the horse in the head with a gun. Right? That's called euthanasia. The cowboy might say, I, euthan I euthanized my horse. I did it out of love. I did it out of mercy. I did it because I cared about the horse, and I didn't want the horse to suffer uh, at all, much less for a long, a prolonged period of time. So active euthanasia is where somebody kills another individual out of mercy. You, you don't assist someone in killing him or herself. This is not suicide. This is A killed B. Okay, not A helped B kill B, but A killed B. That's homicide. So active euthanasia is a form of homicide where one human being kills another. The, the reason it's called euthanasia is that it's motivated by mercy or love or concern or care or compassion or sympathy. Put in whatever term you want there. So in this case, the person who ends up dead is saying, kill me, please. Put me out of my misery. Not help me kill myself, but kill me, please. 
I'm in terrible pain. I want to die as soon as possible. All right, the next category is passive euthanasia. Notice the only difference is active, passive. Passive euthanasia, as I have, as I say here, is says, let me die, please. It doesn't say kill me. It doesn't say cause my death. It says back off and let me die, which implies what? It implies that the person in question, the person being told to back off, could do something to prolong your life. And what you are saying to that person is, no, don't hook me up to the life support machines. That'll keep me alive. I don't want to be alive. Let me die. Okay, so it's passive. It's saying, I want the underlying injury or, dis or disease to end my life. I don't want to be kept alive artificially. Right? I want a natural death from whatever injury or disease I'm afflicted with. Now, passive euthanasia has a number of subcategories, which I've listed here. I just mentioned withholding of life-prolonging treatment. Okay? Don't hook me up to the machines. And you may be familiar with what's called a DNR order, do not resuscitate. There are people who are in institutions like hospitals who are very sick, sometimes very old, maybe terminally ill, and they tell their medical care staff, if I go into cardiac arrest, don't resuscitate me. Let me die, please. Okay? Don't do whatever you can to keep me alive. Okay, so there's typically a, a file on the bed post that has in prominent letters DNR, and that tells everyone who comes into the room immediately, this patient has requested to be allowed to die should he or she go into cardiac arrest or breathing difficulties or whatever the uh, specification is. Also, people have a right under the law, and I would, I would say also morally speaking, to refuse food and or water. Right? You can't be force fed if you are competent and you don't want to be fed or provided with hydration. You have every right under the law and morally speaking to refuse food and water. Okay? That's just another aspect of let me die, please. Okay? And you will eventually die without proper nutrition and hydration. And there's a final twist to this. What if you've already been hooked up to machines? Maybe when you were brought into the hospital or the emergency room, you were incompetent. Maybe you were unconscious. And the emergency room personnel hooked you up immediately to some life support systems. And those are now keeping you alive. Now suppose you come to consciousness and you realize what the situation is you may request that the machines that are keeping you alive be removed or withdrawn from you. That's a way of saying, let me die, please. Now, it's an open question, a philosophically interesting question, whether removing machines that are keeping you alive is killing you or merely letting you die. And there's a philosophical debate about that. I don't want to get into that debate right now. So I'm just assuming, for the purposes of this little taxonomy, I'm just assuming that when you specify or request that machines be removed, uh, you are engaged in passive euthanasia, and that those who comply with your request are not killing you, they're merely letting you die. And maybe there's no morally relevant difference between killing and letting die. Some philosophers have argued that. Some philosophers... I could name them, but the names wouldn't be familiar to you. I'll, I'll name just one if you want to look him up. James Rachels, R-A-C-H-E-L-S. Rachels argued in a famous essay many years ago that there's no morally relevant difference between killing and letting die. So however bad it is to um, kill someone, it's just as bad to let them die. However bad it is to let someone die, it's just as bad and no worse to kill him or her. Now, many people recoil at that. Many, pe many people, maybe you're one of them, hold a different view. Many of you would disagree with Rachel's and say that other things being equal, it's worse to kill 
than it is to let someone die. But again, that's a philosophical debate. It gets quite complicated, and there's no need for us to go into it right now. So let's assume that withdrawing life support systems is a case of passive euthanasia. And notice, finally, that includes, as a subset, removal of food and or water tubes. Suppose you have been, uh, while you were unconscious, suppose hydro artificial hydration and nutrition have been hooked up to you so that you're getting food or nutrients intravenously as well as water intravenously. When you wake up and realize the situation you're in, you, if competent, can specify that, you, that those um, tubes be removed from you. You may say, please remove the artificial hydration and nutrition and let me die. Okay, so that's a form of passive euthanasia. Now, I'm almost done for the day. Let's stand back. What was my point in discussing all of these ways to die other than to freak you out? My point is that Hardwig never really in this essay goes into any detail. When he says that there's a duty to die, and he does argue that, I've, already, I've given you his argument, what exactly is he advocating? Is he, and maybe it's all of these, maybe he's advocating that if you are, have become a substantial burden on your loved ones, you should think seriously about ending your life in any of these ways by, for example, killing yourself if you are able, that would be unassisted suicide, perhaps you can request assistance in killing yourself, that's assisted suicide, and maybe the assistance comes from a doctor, making it physician-assisted suicide. The problem with that is not every state allows it. Oregon does, and about nine or ten other states, in the District of Columbia, I recall. But you may well live in a state like Texas that does not allow physician-assisted suicide. So that may not be a viable option here in Texas. Other things that you might do, you might request active euthanasia, but good luck finding someone willing to do that. Many doctors who have, who have um, engaged in active euthanasia of their patients have been prosecuted for it. So it's a great, you're taking a great risk if you engage in that activity. Passive euthanasia, now that's probably the strongest case. Maybe what Hardwig is advocating is this. If you have become a burden to your loved ones, then make it clear that you don't want to be have your life prolonged artificially. Fill out a DNR order when you're hospitalized, indicating that you don't want to be resuscitated should you go into cardiac arrest or breathing difficulties. You can refuse artificial hydration and nutrition as a way of bringing about your death. So Hardwig, once again, he doesn't go into any detail about how the death will be brought out. He, he, he's doing the philosophical work of arguing for a duty to die rather than the practical nitty-gritty work of specifying how that will occur. Okay, so I can easily ask uh, a number of questions on the exam about uh, just the couple of sections we covered today. When we meet again next week for our final lecture before the exam, we're going to cover the remaining sections. You can see that the titles are Objections to a Duty to Die, and I want to cover those thoroughly. And there are three different objections that I've identified there. Secondly, who specifically has a duty to die? And you can see I've got a number of factors that come into play there. And then there are some other sections. I'm not necessarily going to cover all of them, but I'll cover the important ones. So it's about 50 minutes into the lecture today. That's enough for today. Have a great day and a great weekend. Remember next week, one more lecture on Hardwig, and then we'll pause and take our second exam. Okay, see you next week.